Well, hello, everyone. My name is Elena G. Levine, and I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm author of the new Wiley book called Networking for Nerds. And it's a true honor and a privilege today to present to you one of my favorite topics, ironically, to give talks on, which is how to give a, a winning poster, how to prepare, present, and leverage this winning poster. And I know for some of you, the, the topic of designing a poster is near and dear to your heart. Probably all of you in the audience today either have already done this, you've already created a poster for a conference or an event, or you're going to be doing so. And you probably have thought about the design, but there's actually so much more to preparing and designing and presenting that poster that goes well beyond the design. And that's what I'm really excited to talk to you about today, is how you can actually leverage the fact that you're giving this poster at a special event to really push your, uh, your reputation and your brand, which is your promise of value, into new networks to develop new collaborations, to find new potential collaborators, and to really promote the work that you're doing and how it's impacting your area of science and technology and engineering. So just a couple of quick housekeeping issues. First of all, if you have any trouble seeing or the, the, the slides or hearing me, simply just log out and log back in. And of course, if you want, uh, you are welcome to ask questions. I'll be ask, answering any questions that you have, uh, as many as I can, at the end of the session. And you can simply type those questions into the question console as part of the webinar software that you have there. Um, and so I'd like to thank AGU, and in particular the AGU Career Center, for sponsoring this webinar and for all of the different career services webinars that they do and all the career services that they do throughout the year for you, their constituents. So let's just jump right into this then because I'm really excited to get going and I know you are as well. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be discussing the actual design, as I mentioned, and how to prepare your poster for success at the special event that you're going to be attending. And then we're also going to be discussing a pre-conference marketing strategy. How do we get the word out there about your were about your poster. How do we get the word out there about your poster in advance of the conference or in advance of the workshop or the special event that you're going to, to make sure that people know about it, that they can come to it, that they get excited about, about it, and that they want to meet you at your event, at your conference, and at your poster to learn even more about it and even perhaps collaborate with you. We're also going to be discussing in that same vein a social media strategy that you can employ to really promote your poster and then of course your follow-up because beyond the poster itself, beyond presenting the poster at the conference, at the event, there's a lot more that you can do with that poster besides just hanging it up in your office, uh, in the hallway of your office and then leaving it there. There's a lot more that we can do to leverage it and to really promote the fact that you have this amazing poster and you've done some really great work. Okay. So with that in mind, let's just jump right into this. Let's talk about exactly what we mean by a poster. A poster is not simply a poster, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is that the actual poster that you're going to be presenting has a lot more behind it than just simply words and graphics. Certainly, it is a summary of your research findings. And the way you really want to think about this is that it's a graphically enhanced abstract. And by that, what I mean is, is is that you're not presenting your thesis. It is not your thesis up there on the poster. It's a short abstract, and I'm going to tell you exactly how many words. Up, upward, no more than about 500 words should be sprinkled on the poster, but it's graphically enhanced, and it should tell a story through the graphics and the words. And what it's doing is you can almost think of the poster as a gigantic version of your business card because what it is is that and by the way somebody asked if they can hear me if you can hear me just log back and hopefully you can hear me just to know this but if you can't hear me you can log out and log back in um, what I was trying to say was that um, you look at if you look at the poster as a potential um, version, a large version of your business card, what it's doing is it's telling people what it is that you could potentially do with them or work or do for them if you were a collaborator. So it's engaging the audience in, in, in the story that you're telling. It's enticing others to learn more about what you're working on. It's marketing your brand and your area of expertise and the, the impact and the influence that you have in your area of STEM. It's advertising your problem-solving abilities because you know what? With the post 
poster, the way you actually tell your story, the way you actually have your narrative on your poster is you're sharing examples of the problems that you had to solve, the solutions that you came up with, and the results of those solutions and what those results mean in terms of the influence or the impact on the overall subfield and even larger field of geosciences or science that you happen to be in. It's an invitation to network and form alliances, and that's what's so great about presenting a poster, in particular at a conference, is that it gives you an advantage in networking, because you're the one who's presenting the poster, so you actually have something to talk about. And I'm going to show you examples of that in a little bit, but I'm just so excited about this, because there's so much more that you can do with a poster than just physically stand there and wait for people to walk by. There's more that you can do with it. So that's what a poster is. So what we're trying to do with the poster is that we are we're trying to communicate our findings very quickly and concisely and we're trying very hard to grab the attention of the people that are nearby uh, quickly so that they get excited, that they want to learn more, that they want to engage you in a conversation about your work. And that's why the graphics are so important because, yes, the words are important too, but if I'm standing there right in front of you, I'm going to easily see the words, but I might not see the words if I'm just casually walking by. So that's why we want to have a very large font, especially for the title, and we want to have a larger font also for the words too. So just in case when you get closer, you can read the words, but the graphics are actually what's going to be help to really draw the people in as they're wandering by. Remember, the poster ecosystem is oftentimes a very busy system, and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. So we really need to do certain things on the poster that are very much related to grabbing the person's eye to attracting their attention. And one of the ways that we do this is we also use easily followed text blocks to tell the story. So we never actually have a system where, or a poster, where we are taking the words, and especially if it's a, a poster that is, uh, that is more, that's longer, uh, um, that's longer on the, uh, on the x-axis than the y-axis, excuse me, longer uh, um, lengthwise rather than uh, going up and down, right? When we're looking at a rectangular poster, um, that tends to be longer, um, you know, on the on the longer on on the, the going left to right versus up and down. What we don't want to have is one block of text that goes the entire length of that entire poster because that's really hard to read and you can just imagine doing that. Um, so what we do is we separate out the as the different aspects of the story that you want to tell into blocks of texts and then we actually are able to use that to tell the story to provide the narration and we incorporate a number of different types of graphical elements they can include charts they can include graphs they could include actual pictures you're going to see an example of a poster it's an award-winning poster that uses um, samples ex pictures photographs of samples of sand to show back and forth different samples that this person was working on um, but there's a number of different ways that you can actually explain your work and explain your data using graphics and that's what we want to do but most of all it's telling a tale remember it's a storytelling device so it has to explain in a way that does really attract the audience and entice the audience to ask more questions it tells a tale of you and your research. And that's why it's also like a business card because not only is it communicating and advertising the research and the research results that you have, but it's also telling the tale of who you are as a worker, who you are as a scientist, as an engineer, how you solve problems, your innovativeness, your creativity, your, um, your the way you look at problem solving, that you take a mountaintop view as well as a granulistic view. So it's very interesting in that people can actually grab ideas about who you are and how you might help their organization and maybe even invite you to apply for jobs or even invite you in for an interview for a position just from the poster. They get excited from the poster and from talking with you about your research as you're explaining your poster too. So that's why it's like a business, business card as well. Now, the ecosystem, as I mentioned, it's a very complicated ecosystem. It's a chaotic ecosystem in some cases in which you are presenting your poster. So what we have to think about is when we are presenting our poster, how are people going to be interacting with us? So, of course, it's often a noisy and crowded environment. Uh, it's often during receptions. I find that, you know, with, with especially within uh, with, with the AGU fall meeting, the 
uh, there's often beer being poured during the receptions, which is also when the poster uh, farm is open so people can wander in and out. So people are standing, they're walking by, they're wandering around, they're getting food, they're getting drink. And so we have to be able to take advantage of the system to understand the finite aspects of the system if we're going to grab people's attention and if we're going to really network our way through the system with our poster. So with any of, with, of course, with anything that we are preparing, with any presentation, with any poster, we have to start with the design issue. So first we have to find out what the dimensions are of the specific poster that is required for this particular conference and follow the exact instructions. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, Elena, I have a PhD or a master's degree or even just a bachelor's degree in science. I know to follow instructions. Why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because, believe it or not, most people don't follow exact instructions of anything. Uh, you, you would be surprised how many fellowship applications are thrown out because people did not follow the 10 specific instructions that were required for that particular fellowship. And so that's why I say it, I say it again, I say it 17 times, follow the exact instructions as dictated by the organization as to what you need to do for the poster. Find out what the dimensions are required, don't go over by one inch, don't go over by one nanometer. Find out, is it an electronic poster? We're going to talk about that more in a moment. Or is it to be a printed? And then you want to find out for yourself, what's your budget? You know, I mean, is it something that you can spend a lot of money on it? Or do you want to spend a little bit of money on it? And also, what's your time frame to get from design phase and also completion of the project to the actual presentation date? So you need to know that as well. So these are some of the things you need to be thinking about. And all this information, by the way, you often will find out on the website for the organization. Of course, AGU, they pr print this right on their website and in their program. And you can, if you don't know, just call the organization. Call the association that's organizing the conference and ask them, what are the dimensions of the poster? Will I have, have to bring my own, uh, my own? is it going to be on a bulletin board? Where is it going to be posted? Do I need to bring my own, um, you know, push pins? Uh, can I add anything extra to the bulletin board? We're going to talk more about that because that's an essential part of the poster too. What are the hours that I'm going to be scheduled at the poster? Uh, you Will I know those in advance? Um, and will it be an actual electronic poster where it's actually on a monitor versus a poster that is that is uh, that is put on a screen, projected on a screen, versus a physical poster that you need to print out. So these are the questions, some of the questions that you want to ask as you're designing and preparing your poster. Now the elements on the poster are kind of basic, but when you think about it, these are things that are also really essential and just something you really want to think about because I'm going to show you some posters in a few moments and some of these posters are not that fabulous. They're fake posters. I just want to make that clear. They are not real posters, but they are, they were used as teaching devices and some of them are just not the greatest posters and you're going to see why they're not the greatest. Some of them don't even have some of these elements that you see in front of you. And it's amazing to me, again, you know, why you put together a poster. You're telling a story of how you've solved a scientific or engineering problem, how you looked at that problem, what was the problem, and how you solved it, and what the impact was of your solution. These are the things you need to include on the poster. So we have to start with the title, and it should be engaging. Remember, I need to be able to grab your attention as you walk by if you're drinking, okay? Then we're going to put the authors and the affiliations, and sometimes people forget to put the affiliations, but you do need that. And you also need to put the author or the corresponding author's email address. So I need to know how I can get in touch with at least one person who is associated with this poster. Then you need to tell me what the why was. What was the problem that you were endeavoring to solve? And then your methodology. What was the solution? How did you solve this problem? How did you figure out how to solve this problem? How did you collect data? What, what, what did the data say? Tell me about the data. What did it reveal to you? And then, of course, the conclusion, which is the results of your solutions and what the data was able to reveal to you. And then I need to know the significance or the relevance of your work. In other words, the impact, like I was saying a few moments ago, the impact on the greater field and then any next steps that you might want to take in this area or next steps that somebody else could take from based on the work that you've completed. You also want to include, as I mentioned, your contact information 
and funding sources. So don't forget to include the funding sources. Another thing that sometimes people forget to put is where they got the support. Um, and you should include logos from your institution as well as from the funding source if you can possibly get it. And believe me, unless the funding source is a private individual or you know your very, very wealthy uncle who would wish to remain anonymous, generally the funding institution does want to be acknowledged. And so you can even ask them, do you want to be acknowledged and how should I do that on the poster? Do you want to send me a version of your logo that I can use? Always nice to do that to ask just to make sure. Now the title of your poster should be the largest type on the poster. It should be catchy as I mentioned. I'm going to give you some examples and it should convey your conclusion. And what you want to do is black on white is best. So black type on a white background. And the reason is, is because the human eye actually reads better when you have black type on a white background versus white type on an all black background. Think about it, the newspapers, I know some of you are aware of newspapers. They existed about 2000 years ago when I was an undergraduate, I would read newspapers. And you know, newspapers were printed white paper black ink on the white paper. It's just so much easier to read. So that's why we do black on white as opposed to white ink on black, on a black background. So make sure you do that. And, and when I say black on white, it doesn't have to be pure white. It could be slightly uh, different colors, like a light blue or a light yellow or something like that. But make sure that the text itself is a very dark black so that people can easily see it. We're not gonna use our title in all caps because we're not uh, you know, 15 years old and we're not excited about Justin Bieber, but instead we're going to just use caps and lowercase to convey our title. And typically the font size should be about 60 to 80 point. And you're gonna use a sans serif or a sans serif type. And that's the type that you see there below, that you see in front of you. And what it is, is it the, the serif or the serif, I never know how to pronounce it, it could be pronounced both ways, is it's a serif, that's the little piece at the bottom of the T. In fact, you see that kind of there with the T in, in the word best there, right in front of you, where it says black and white is best. The little T, that thing that sticks out at the bottom of the T, that's a serif, that's a serif. And so that typically is what we don't want want on a on um, type because again this is also something that people have figured out that people read better when there's no serifs there's no serif so that's why we use a sans serif which means no serif so a great example of that is an Arial font now the blocks of text tell the story so we start with the problem the why and the conclusions then we say, what did I do or what did I add? Then we discuss the methodologies. Then we discuss what I found out. Then we discuss the recommendations. This is just another way of saying what I was just saying a few moments ago. And by the way, you're going to get a number of resources, some of which I uh, was able to tap for this webinar at the end. Here's an example of one of them. Cornell's website had a really, really nice explanation of how to design a poster and what to put on it. You're going to get that at the end of the webinar. Now design tips. I like to design my posters using PowerPoint because what you can do is you can start small and then you can actually scale it up. But you could use Adobe Illustrator. You could use pretty much whatever design website or excuse me, design software you find you useful and you find easy, just as long as you're able to actually produce it. And uh, you want, like I said, total words on the entire poster are only going to be five to eight hundred words it that's really I said 500 words max but you know really five to eight hundred words max would be I think 800 words might even be a little bit too much but remember this is not your thesis this is not a 2,000 or 3,000 word journal paper this is an abstract an illustrated abstract so that's why we have such a small number of words and what we're going to do is we're going to try avoid high densities of texts so we're going to split the text up into different blocks so that people can follow the story and even jump to different sections of your story like if they wanted to just jump to the data or jump to the result or jump to the impact they could do that and they would know where to do that because you would have those subheadings now we're going to avoid dark or image soaked backgrounds and you're going to see an example of that in a moment again for the same reason I was saying earlier about how it's just easier for the human eye and the key here is the human eye right not another animal but the human eye 
is able to read things better when it's black ink on white or black ink on a very light background. We're going to watch our colors. Now this is really important because when you design these really fancy and nice graphics and charts and, and, and graphs and things like that that are showing all of your data and your data is just truly amazing. If you design it in colors that people who have a color differentiation challenge or are colorblind, they might not necessarily get the differentiation between the data points. So yes, you can use colors, and I encourage people to use colors, but just be aware that if you have a graph that is very, like has three different types of greens, and all the greens are exactly, you know, just like one tick away from shade, in other words, they all look almost very, they look very, very close to each other, except for, you know, what, like I said, just one tick shade darker, one tick a shade darker, then this could be hard for somebody to read. Quite frankly, it'd be hard, I think, for any to read um, but just be aware that there are certain colors also that some people who do have color differentiation challenges um, have a general challenge with like I know my uncle he was colorblind with greens and reds so he couldn't tell the difference between greens and reds which of course made it very difficult when he was driving um, so just be aware of that um, and then as, as I mentioned you use a sans serif for the title but we're going to use a serif font for the body of the poster and then we're going to use lists to explain our work instead of blocks. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. This is actually the text itself is in lists as much as possible. Now we're looking to enhance the story with visuals. So we wanna add charts, we wanna add graphs, we wanna add pictures, but not just to have them there. They should have a purpose. Do they help to tell the story? Are they easy to see or read or interpret, especially from, from close, up, close up, but definitely from far away as well? Um, you know, if I'm walking by and I'm rehab, you know, I have a beer, am I easily able to understand what your graph or what your picture is telling me? When you use pictures and photographs, make sure you incorporate a scale bar as well as a caption. Don't assume the audience is necessarily going to understand what your picture is depicting. You have to tell me what it is. Now here's the design layout. Now I want to make sure that it's clear that I designed this slide myself. Yes, this is what I did for you, the audience. It's I spent 10 hours designing just this slide because you guys are the best audience ever and ever will be. And I'm so appreciative of your attention. Look how detailed and fine and beautiful this slide is. It's just fabulous. I think you would agree that I'm a brilliant artist. And what I wanted to depict with this slide is the design layout for your poster. So note the design layout is the layout and the direction of the text. So we start from the upper left hand corner and we go down, then we go back up to the the top and we go down and then we go to a third column and then we go down again it's not reading left to right left to right left to right and then coming back left to right left to right to right coming back it's going down and then going down and then going down in three or more tech larger text box that go across the, uh, the, the, the length of the poster. So if you're curious uh, about this particular slide and if you'd like me to sign a copy of this beautiful artist rendering, I'd be happy to do that. Just send me an email. The text sizes that we want to think about, title, like I said, about 85 point. The authors should be about 56 point. The subheadings, right, problem, solution, result, impact, about 36 point. Body text, no smaller than 24. And captions, I actually like to put the captions bigger than 24, but if you have to save room and need to go a little bit slower, lower, then you can go to an 18 point. But you see where we're, we're going lower and lower and lower in terms of our point threshold of how big the text should be for each of those different sections. And I'll just wait a moment for you to write this down because this is important for you to, to keep in mind of about when you do design your poster, what you want to keep each section and each piece of the puzzle or each piece of the poster puzzle, how big the, those different fonts should be. Now let's talk a moment about electronic posters because this is another interesting thing that's happening. I'm seeing a lot more conferences that are offering the, either the opportunity to present your poster in electronic format or are actually doing posters um, uh, that are actually doing posters that are, you can either get the option of 
projecting the poster on a screen. You could get the option of putting the poster on a large monitor, or you could go with the traditional of printing the poster. And so um, I want to take a moment about this, to, to, a moment to talk to you about this issue, because if there is the option of doing an electronic poster, certainly you want to find out if that is the option. Um, and if that is, you want to know how big the screen is or and how big the monitor is going to be, when whether you should bring your own computer or theirs. And of course, if even if they say you can don't have to bring your own computer, just bring it on a thumb drive. Of course, as a scientist, you know that you're going to be double, triple, and quadruple checking everything. So you're always going to bring your computer just in case, because you never know it could be break, their computer could break at the last moment. If you have the opportunity to do an electronic poster in one of these formats, either on a monitor or on a screen, it's actually a great idea to, to consider it for, for yourself for a next conference because it actually allows you a little bit more flexibility in terms of your graphics. Think about this. You could add a movie. You could add a really nice animation. You could do a couple of different things in terms of changing pictures. So there does give you some flexibility in telling your story. The same elements still apply that we talked about in terms of the text boxes and in terms of how you actually narrate the story in terms of the problem, solution, result, and impact. However, we're going to make maybe add a little bit more, some more graphics that are a little bit more engaging. And that's what's so exciting. If you have the flexibility to change things around or if somebody's talking to you and they say, well, what did you ever look at the data in terms of X? And you could say, absolutely, let me show you what we did in terms of X. The poster here is talking about Y, but I can quickly pull up the animation or the charts or the graphs that relate to X. So you have all that extra information at your disposal on the computer to share with the audience if they're there. Now, get there early, of course, and always provide different versions of your electronic poster, especially for you crazy folks out there who have a Mac, and I'm, I'm one of you now, I have an iPhone, so I'm slowly moving in that area, but, you know, bring your talk as a PDF, as a PPT, you know, bring it in various different formats, bring it on seven thumb drives, bring it on your computer, we're going to talk about mobile devices in a few moments, you know, send it by carrier pigeon, telegraph it in, uh, bring it it on a zip drive, bring it on a disk from 1980, anything so that you have every backup possible just in case one breaks. Okay. Now we also with the electronic posters, this is also a really nice thing that you can do is you could potentially zoom in. And this is something you want to ask the poster coordinator for the conference. You know, will I be able to have that flexibility to zoom in or to change screens and things like that? But even if it is an electronic poster, you want to have bring your own business cards and have printouts of the printed poster ready to give to people. Uh, so that in case they are walking by and they don't get a chance to talk to you more in depth or they didn't, they stop by when you were physically not there, you would have that ready for them. I'm going to give you some tactics about that in just a moment. With the animations of the movies, think about it. You're going to do some tests before you actually go to the conference to make sure that they work. Just make sure they're not too distracting. That's the key. Now, a couple of tips as we're thinking about this, as we're designing the posters, we're getting ready to put the poster together to get to go to the conference. So first of all, we're going to proofread it. And um, isn't it hilarious that I tell you again to proofread your poster, proofread your poster, proofread your poster, because I guarantee you that for, especially for those of you, uh, but not just for those of you who are in geosciences, but let's say you're a geophysicist, you will misspell geophysics wrong on your poster. And the reason is, is because you're just too close to it. You're just too close to it. So you need to have somebody else proofread it. You should proofread it, have somebody else proofread it, preferably somebody within your group, such as your PI or your mentor. And then I really recommend having somebody proofread your poster who is not in science or not in your area of science or engineering at all, because we want to make sure, and just in case nobody else did catch that you, mis you misspelled um, geo geophysics or uh, geology or physics, we want to make sure that somebody else outside the area who's not used to it would easily catch it. Can you imagine how, uh, how um, upsetting it might be if you misspelled the word physics and wrote psychics on your poster? That would be like a completely different poster, and, and it might not be exactly the audience that you want to attract to, to your research. So we want to be very careful about proofreading it. And a really great idea for how to get feedback on your poster, on the text of the poster, the way you're telling the story on the poster, the images on the poster, 
This is such a great idea. It's not my idea, but I, I just love this idea. You post your poster. You're going to print out your poster in advance. And that's one of a really important tip is that you're actually going to have your poster with you when you travel. And I know it's annoying to travel with a poster tube and to take the poster with you, but it's actually the best choice as opposed to having it printed there because you never know. What if they mess up? What if they run out of paper? What if they run out of this? What if they don't close or open in time? So we always want to have it with us. We could always print another copy if we wanted to there but the big poster we're going to bring with us so while we're preparing for it while we're getting ready for the poster for the amazing poster presentation that you're going to do take your poster put it on the hallway post it on the hallway in your office and next to it put some sticky notes and some sharpies and ask people send out an email to your to your organization to your department or to your team or put a note next to it or do both asking people for anonymous feedback on your poster and ask them to make comments on the sticky notes and put the sticky notes on the different part parts of your poster that they think you could improve and it could be design ideas it could be uh, the storytelling ideas it could be graphic ideas ideas associated with the charts and graphs that you're using uh, as well as the actual text itself the copy editing uh, even the title um, even the way you present your uh, logo maybe you should put the logo on the left versus the right or something like that and ask people for complete uh, honest feedback and in this anonymous environment where they just get to if they're walking by they see the poster the sticky notes and the sharpie and they can quickly put a note up there I've seen people get really good feedback that they might not otherwise get because people in your group like if you're showing your poster to your group you know the poster people the people in your group they might feel you know they don't want to necessarily tell you the truth if there's something really wrong with the poster because they don't want to hurt your feelings but in this case it's totally anonymous so they can hurt your feelings and and you will gain something really important out of it a better produced poster which is what you want to do now for posters that are going to be especially for posters that are going to be projected onto a screen through an LCD projector you do want to project the poster onto a wall uh, so you can see the, the uh, how big it is and how it's actually being scaled but it's also good to project the poster onto a wall before printing it so you can check the formatting at the actual size so rather than print it and find out that this text was wrong in terms of the size or things are just formatting really strangely at a higher size than what you're used to looking on your little screen project the poster onto the wall so you can check it out and see exactly how the formatting looks and you're going to convert it to a PDF um, when you actually send it to people because you want to have complete control over how people see it but I always say if you're going once you print it as you're ready to print it convert it to a PDF because if you give it to a third party to print it like a Kinko's or a FedEx office or something like that they may not have the exact uh, software that you have or the exact software version that you have in which case the version of PowerPoint that you used to make your poster they printed in another version the formatting comes out completely wrong so convert it to a PDF before printing so you have complete control and know exactly how it should be viewed and how it will be printed final thought about some tips is that you want to watch your acronyms now, of course, you're going to a technical conference, and most conferences that you will be going to will be technical in nature. In other words, the people there are not only experts in your field, in this case, geophysics, but they're also experts in your subfield, and there's going to be people there who know about your sub-subfield and even your sub-sub-subfield. But there are also going to be people there who are not necessarily familiar with the acronyms of your sub subfield or your subfield or even your field so I'm going to talk to you about two different audiences that might be coming up to your poster that could present hidden opportunities for you for networking for career advancement for professional development for professional advancement of your group of your research to find new collaborators so on the one hand there's going to be people who are, are are technical experts who are scientists and engineers but might not necessarily know your subfield of geophysics or your subfield of physics so if you're going to use acronyms and jargon and that's totally fine to do make sure you spell out the acronym first or if you think the jargon the word Word, the vocabulary word is especially you know narrow for that particular area of science then make sure you explain what that is just so that somebody who is walking by who does have a background in physics or geophysics would at least be able to understand the gist of what you're saying okay so that's important now if there's another type of audience member that you will be encountering 
whether you realize it or not, especially at large conferences like AGU, where there's 26,000 people attending, this is what you want to think about. You know, a lot of people come to conferences and they bring their partners, they bring their spouses, especially when the conference is in such a great city like San Francisco. And so especially when when the poster farm is open, and by the way, I use that phrase poster farm to just mean the, the big hall where all the posters are, because it's like an industrial farm with just poster after poster after poster. If I'm coming to the conference and I brought my spouse, my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, what have you, they may actually come with me to some of the receptions that are taking place in the poster hall, uh, you know, like the icebreaker or something like that. And sometimes pa partners of people who are attending conferences not only can attend for free, but they often will buy a one-day pass or a pass just to be able to attend the, the icebreaker or the networking function or even the networking function that's associated with the poster, uh, poster presentations and poster farm. So what happens is, is now you have this hidden audience that's wandering the poster farm, right? Now, you know that there's going to be geophysicists at the AGU conference. That's obvious. But the spouses and the partners of the geophysicists that accompany them to this conference who are also going to be looking at your poster, you don't know what their background is. Now, they could be geophysicists, geoscientists. They could be scientists and engineers in other fields. They could be academics in other fields completely in the humanities and social sciences. Or, quite frankly, they could be executives in companies and organizations for which you endeavor to work. Maybe you want to work in oil and gas, and I come to the conference and I bring my girlfriend, and she is an executive. Maybe she's the human resources director of oil of Chevron or ExxonMobil, and you don't know that. You know that I'm the geophysicist, but I haven't introduced my girlfriend, so you don't know that she's an executive, that she's representing oil and gas, and that's what you want to work for. Now, the point of me telling you this is the following. Since you have this hidden population that's going to be migrating around the poster farm and potentially seeing your poster, Posters, you want to make sure that your poster is clear enough and tells a story that even somebody without a background in your area of geophysics or geosciences would understand because they may be the person who is going to invite you in for an interview or they may be the person who is so taken with your story with your narrative, with your design, with your networking at the poster itself that they want to introduce you to their colleague who is somebody who would be interested in inviting you in for, in, inviting you in for an interview. So this hidden population is very important, especially at large conferences. You never know who you're talking to. You never know who that person who is standing there right in front of you with an AGU badge, who their spouse or partner is standing next to you or who their par par partner is or spouse is who they're going to talk about you with later at dinner. So important things to think about, okay? So make sure that your narrative, your, your uh, information, your brand, your promise of value, and the promise of what your work is, is clear to those people as well. Because that could lead to some really amazing opportunities. All right, let me give you some examples of some posters. Because I know you're just dying to know what some good posters look like and what some bad posters look like. So in front of you, you have a poster. Wow, what a great poster this is. I just love this poster. And of course, I'm being facetious here. This poster sucks big time. Now, if we were in a talk right now, I'd ask for your input as to why you think this poster sucks. Unfortunately, I can't hear you, but I know you're screaming, Elena, this poster sucks. This poster sucks. This poster sucks. Let's talk about why this poster sucks. And by the way, this is not a real person. This poster was created specifically as a teaching tool. So I want to make that clear. So um, this poster, first of all, with that black background and then the dark background in the text box, boxes very hard to read the white on the black just like we had we were talking about earlier another really bad thing about this poster the title is very hard to read it's very good for somebody who has star wars vision because that's clearly what it's meant for but it's not good for a regular human being there's also other pieces of this poster that are not clear like for example in the upper right hand corner i'm guessing that's meant to be a logo and the logo says if you look very carefully you can see it it says the high fructose sugar association which i don't know if it's a 
real association. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to God that it's not a real association. But just in case it is, you can't even read that logo. It's so hard to read. And then there's other things on the left here that are on the upper left hand corner that are hard to read as well. Now, the other thing that's really wrong about this poster is not only the colors and things of that nature, but look at the introduction. So that's the big text box in the middle. And remember earlier I was saying we want to keep the text boxes, the text in the text boxes, stay away from paragraphs if at all possible, use bullet points to describe your story because it's just easier for people to read. Just like it's easier for me to read on a resume your experience in bullet points, it's so much easier for me to read your poster if it's in bullet points too. And so what they don't do is they don't use the bullet points. They just have the, po they just have the, the text uh, paragraphs, but you can see how close the text gets to the edge of the box. And it's so long that it's just, I mean, you can imagine how big this post would be if I'm reading this really long thing it just goes on and on and on it's just so long in terms of the length of the poster in fact the conclusions is almost the entire length of the entire poster and that's just so difficult to read so we don't want that and then we also have this picture here on the left and I, I'm looking at this picture I'm trying to figure out what this picture is and what the purpose of having that picture is looking carefully I can see it's a scale and since the title of this poster is called pigs in space effect of zero gravity and ad libitum feeding on weight gain in cavia porcellus I'm guessing that's meant to be a kind of pig on a scale and it says zero zero on the scale so I'm guessing they're trying to make a cute picture of a pig but this means nothing to me and I have to look carefully to even understand what the picture is trying to say what the picture is so you can see that this is not a good poster so hopefully this will never ever be what your poster looks like here's another really great poster oh my goodness wow I just love this poster um, can any of you even read this poster I can't even read the poster let alone even know what the rest of the poster is saying and I want to tell you just in case you can't read the title which is so difficult to read because it's black on dark blue ink OMG I can't it's it's amazing that this poster was put together of course this is again also a fake poster meant for a teaching tool the title of this poster is if you can read this you must be nocturnal and that's why I kept mentioning earlier the importance of what the human eye can read versus the eyes of a bat or a spider or a uh, scorpion okay so make sure that your poster is visible to a human as opposed to a scorpion or a bat now we're getting into a little bit of better posters take a look at this poster the the title pretty tall pretty excuse me pretty big cooling effects of dirt purge holes on the tips of gas turbine blades okay I, I think I can understand what that means and then they have the text boxes uh, the text box they don't have much text at all uh, they have some interesting visuals they have that picture right in the center with a figure a caption it says large-scale turbine blade in a wind tunnel you know I think what could be improved here is I think if they actually put a border around the text box it would be easier for me to read I think if they had a little bit more text explaining in bullet point form what the problem solution result and impact was I think that would be better um, they certainly are missing the uh, author's email address uh, they do have the Virginia Tech logo up there and the acknowledgments for the sponsor which was Pratt and Whitney at the bottom but you can see we're getting to a little bit better and I think the only thing that also could be improved is the uh, the figure four figure five those are those two graphic elements that describe different things associated with these gas turbine blades those could be a little bit difficult to read because we're getting really small text there so I think that text could be improved and increased in size this is another tech another um, poster which is really interesting to me because so they have that light background it's a light blue background for those of you who can't tell but then what they did to make it interesting was they added white text box box boxes on top of the light blue and I thought that was a good idea for a graphic element and you can tell that in that middle column you can see under the words for results graphs of population trends and then it says without additional mortality the manatee population keeps growing and that text that text that I just read to you if you look very carefully it's in a white text box in the shape of an arrow pointing to that uh, that um, graph which is a little hard to read because it's so small so I think they could improve the size of the graphs and increase the size of the graphs 
But what I wanted to point out was this really clever idea of using the text boxes in the shape of arrows that then point to the corresponding graphic elements. But the problem that they had, the challenge that they had, was they put a white text box on top of a very light, in this case, light blue background, so it's very hard to see that image, that image of the arrow. So if they wanted to do that, what I would recommend is actually putting a border around that arrow so I could see that this is what you were pointing to. Increasing the size of the, the font that's being used to describe the individual graphics and the font inside the graphics would be useful. Um, they have the uh, the name of the person who wrote this and also the name, their email address, and they have a really interesting and great uh, eye-catching title. Will manatees still exist in 2100? Wow, I don't know, but now I'm really excited to know if that will be the case. And that's a picture of a manatee in the upper right-hand corner. I think that picture could be a little bit better, but I like the fact that they put a picture because you know what? Some people don't even know what a manatee is. So there's some really good elements here. And also what I liked about this poster was they ordered the, they used numbers to order the different text boxes so you knew which where you started and where you went. Number one for introduction, number two for objectives, number three for methods. And note that they use the same uh, graphic uh, direction that I recommended with that wonderful piece of art that I offered to sign for you, uh, where they start at the upper left-hand corner, they go down, then they go to the second column, which is in the middle, they go down, then they go to the top right, and they go down for the third column. So they're doing it all starting from the left, going to right, and we're doing columns that go down and go down and go down. This is another interesting uh, um, poster. I think it could be improved with a little bit more graphics and also with some borders around the text box. But this, this poster I liked especially because of the fact that they did use the bullet points. It made it very easy for me to quickly see what things were. The images that they have in the bottom left-hand corner, the histological analysis, those images are very hard to understand unless you know about histology. So that might be better to be, that what could be due what could be done to improve on this poster could be to um, add a little bit of explanation of what those images are or maybe use different images. This is getting better. I like this poster. It's a little busy. Yes, it is a little busy, but I like their use of graphics here. They had a really good eye-catching uh, um, uh, title, Can Suburban Greenways Provide High-Quality Bird Habitat? So if you're in that area of ecology, this would be something of interest to you. They had eye-catching uses of sub uh, headings, birds of conservation concern in birds of conservation concern in decline. Uh, that's an example of the first one. I liked how they differentiated the different text box using the. In this case, they did use white on blue, but because it was just for the subheading, it doesn't take away. It doesn't take away from the the whole narrative. I liked their use of images, but their images could I think be better explained. And of course, their data sets, which are right there in the center um, on graphs, are very hard to read. It looks like they're just plots, and so I think that could be improved. Maybe using a different type of graph to describe the data would be an improvement on this. And finally, I wanted to show you this poster. This poster, I want to express appreciation to um, UT Austin's Jackson School of Geosciences. This is an award-winning poster. It's a geosciences poster. So this, these people, Pamela and Whitney, won an award. I believe it was through UT, ja UT uh, Austin Jackson School for their poster. And it was so good, I wanted to show it to you. So what's great about this poster? Um, you know, first of all, the organization and the description, everything is really nice. Um, they they uh, they put the title right there, evaluating the consistency of experimental. I'm going to mis mispronounce this name, but paleopiezometers using naturally deformed rocks. If you're in that area of geosciences, you would get it. Maybe if you were out of that area of geosciences, it might not be clear. So that could be cleaned up a little bit. But I think for the technical audience that they're expecting for this poster, it was fine. Um, they describe things. Uh, they have really good subheadings. Uh, they have really good images there. And this is what I was telling you about the images describing the different grain sizes, which I thought was very good. Um, and their plot points and their graphs that describe what it is that they're, they're talking about is also very useful and very good too. And they even have bullet points describing what they worked on. So I think this was really good. And I think that they they did win an award. They, I mean, I know they won an award, but what I mean is I think that they the fact that they won the award was well-deserved. I think it is an award-winning poster. So this is a great example of a poster. 
So a couple of thoughts, more, more thoughts about the poster and the poster ecosystem. We're going to print our poster, as I mentioned, and we're going to take it with us. And what else are we going to take with us to the conference? We're going to take mini versions of our poster. So we're going to take PDF versions of our poster printed on either 8.5 by 11 or 11 by 17 or 11 by 14 sheets of paper so that we can actually hand those out to people. We are going to bring business cards. Of course, every conference we go to, even if we're a student, even if we're an undergraduate student, we are going to be bringing business cards. They don't have to be anything fancy. They can just say your name, uh, candidate, bachelor's degree, candidate, PhD in geophysics, the University of Arizona, uh, my email address, my phone number, my LinkedIn profile, so somebody could easily get my resume if they wanted to. That's why you put your LinkedIn profile on there. And you could also put a couple of words that describe your technical expertise. So, you know, in, in a particular area of, of uh, geophysics, you could describe, you know, two or three of your areas. Like my business card itself says, um, my business card says uh, writer, speaker, and career consultant. So that as soon as somebody sees my business card, they know exactly what it is that I can do for them. But now here is something amazing that I want to tell you. So just take this moment to clear your brain because I am about to blow your mind with this idea. Okay? You have your business card. The next time you know that you're going to be giving a talk or a poster at a conference, print out stickers that list the title, the date, the time, the location of the talk or the poster, as well as a QR code to get more information, put that sticker on the back of your business card. And now when you go and meet people at the conference, you can give them your business card and you can say, oh, it's so nice to meet you, Bill Gates. I'm so glad you were able to come to AGU this year. By the way, I'm giving a talk on well characterization. I'd love to invite you. I'm giving a poster on well characterization. I'd love to invite you. Here's my business card. And if you look on the back, that's where my poster is going to be taking place, the date and the time and the location. I hope you can come. Wow. Did I not just blow your mind? Are you not like just... Holy macaroni, Elena, my life is now complete because of that tip. I know that's what you're thinking right now. I know when I heard that tip, I nearly freaked out. So this is such a great tactic. Do this because it's such a great way to promote yourself, your work, and your poster and your talk to more populations. And how professional is it at a networking mixer to be able to pull out your business card and say, I'd love to invite you to come to my poster or my talk. Here's the information right here at your fingertips. So you're going to bring your business cards and you're going to have that with you. You're also going to post business cards with a thumbtack. You're going to post business cards onto the bulletin board where your poster is being uh, posted. And you're also going to post up a sign-up sheet asking people if they want more information or if they'd like for you to contact them to discuss it, that they could add their email address so you can do that. You'll also include copies of the paper. So if you have a paper that your poster is based on, you can include copies of your paper as well. And you know, in my toolbox, whenever I'm presenting a poster at a conference, I always bring with me a sharp a Sharpie, a black Sharpie, a black or a blue Sharpie, and a, or both, and white correctors tape, just in case you do catch a mistake that, that the 17 people who've reviewed your poster, including yourself, didn't catch beforehand. This way, if you do catch a mistake, you'll be able to quickly fix it, you'll use the white corrector's tape, and you'll be able to do uh, fix it with the Sharpie. And that's why you use the black and the blue. Bring the black and the blue with you, because if your text is in black or text is in blue, you'll just be able to match that. Didn't I blow your mind? Aren't you like amazed right now? I know I am. So you also want to be thinking about how you can pre prepare and have your poster ready on mobile devices. So at your tablet, your phone, I like to have, before I go physically walk into the convention hall, I will have my poster already loaded up and easily easy to access on my iPhone or my and or my tablet, as well as related resources, for example, videos, animations, pictures, other data points, things like that. So that just in case I run into somebody who is Dr. God in my field, you know, we're chatting for a few moments, or I make an appointment to meet Dr. God and we're chatting and having a cup of coffee, I can quickly pull up my poster, I can quickly pull it up on the tablet to show him or her. We just want an easy way for you to be able to show it to people if they want more information, as well as to email it 
it and send it send over an electronic version in case people want it. And that's why I like to have it up and ready to go even before I actually walk into the convention center. Now, even before I walk into the convention center, we want to build buzz about your poster. We want to bring people to your poster because you've done some really fantabulous work and we want people to know about it. So do invite people at least a few weeks in advance to meet with you at the conference. Invite them specifically to attend your poster when you're going to be presenting. Let them know the date and the time. You know, you can invite potential companies, potential departments, potential collaborators, potential PIs, whoever it is that you're interested in sharing what you've done, you can invite you to attend your poster. Do this. Let people know that you're doing your poster, presenting it, and be able to give out copies of that poster of your business card, excuse me, with the information about your poster presentation. Now, when you are presenting in front of your poster, you're going to have multiple versions of your pitch of what you're what you're describing your poster is all about. So it's very important for you to practice this also in advance and be ready to move from one to another depending on what the audience is. And the, what the audience is, who they are, will be revealed to you as you ask them questions. Oh, are you a geophysicist? Oh, do you work for the University of Arizona? Oh, what's your area of geosciences? Is it economic geology or is it X? So what you want to do is have several versions of your pitch, which is your elevator pitch or your 30-second commercial, which describes the problem, solution, result, and impact uh, for someone who is in your sub-subfield, for someone who's in your subfield, for somebody with, you, with a general geological or geophysical background, for somebody who is a scientist but not necessarily a geophysicist, for somebody who's an engineer for a potential employer, for a potential collaborator, and of course for the general public. And that's that hidden population that's going to be migrating around your poster that you want to be able to grab as well. So practice this and really show you can do this by practicing in front of your PI, but what would be really even better is if you can show your poster and do your presentation, your pitch about your poster for somebody who is not in science so that, that you can see whether or not you are truly telling your story and the narrative makes sense to that person. We're not dumbing down our topics. We never dumb down our topics. We just respect the audience and their knowledge and their expertise, and we put together a communication strategy that it respects what they know and helps them to understand what it is that we do and why they would consider it important. So it's going to be a short version of your talk. If you were giving a talk, it will be a short version of your talk, which is what your pitch is, anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes. It could be revealed over the course of a conversation. It might not be all just one you know, shout out. But you're going to be telling me what your conclusion is, the significance and the relevance, some methodologies, and give some examples so that I understand. Now, as we build buzz in advance, tweet it out. Use the conference hashtag. Use the conference. Use the organization's handle. Let people know about it. Invite people to come to it. Post it on the group's Facebook and LinkedIn page. AGU Career Center has a Facebook page. It has a LinkedIn group. Um, there's a, a hashtag specific. There's, excuse me. There's a handle specifically for the AGU Career Center. There's also a, ha a handle for the AGU called at the AGU. And then there's the AGU Fall Meeting. Hashtag, we want people who are searching for that hashtag to find your poster. And you, of course, email potential collaborators to view it and let them know, hey, if you're not going to be at the conference, I can send you a version of it. I can send you the PDF. When people approach, remember, you have the advantage for the networking because you have something to say. You have something to talk about. You're going to be talking about your poster and the work that you've done. So engage them. Give them eye contact. Look at them. Smile. Reach out to shake their hand. But be ready to explain anything on the poster because anything you put up there is fair game for them to ask. Now, there'll be a lot of really, really nice people that are going to want to ask you questions about your poster, but there's also going to be a couple of different types of people that are going to show up that I just want to take a moment to address how you handle these people. Some of them aren't even people. They're from the netherworld, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So one type of audience member are what I call the aggressive inquisitors. So these are people who are either literally jerks or are acting jerk-like. And what I mean by that is they ask you questions about your work and about your poster and about your research that you may or may not be able to answer. They may be purposely asking you a question that they know you don't know the answer of based on the data that you have. Or they're asking you very controversial questions associated with your work. Now, the non-jerks are just doing this because they are naturally curious and they want to know. They don't realize that they're, they're being a little 
on the rude side. So they are people, they're just curious and they're just, they're just being naturally inquisitive about what they're doing. And they're coming off a little rude, but they don't mean to be rude. But then there's the other kind, which are the jerks who are truly trying to be rude and truly trying to trip you up. And with both of these type of aggressive inquisitors, you always want to show them respect, even if they're acting rude towards you. Again, you don't know who they are. You don't know who's watching you. And you have to be the professional at all times. Professional means you're just serious about your craft in all ways and at all times. And it's reflected in the way you speak to aggressive inquisitors. So if somebody comes up and asks you a question that, first of all, you don't know the answer to, you can simply say, you know what, thank you for that question. It's a great question. That's not something that we worked on with this data, but I'd be happy to follow up with you. Or this is not something that was in the scope of my research, but it's a great idea. I'll consider pursuing that the next time I look at it. Or, you know what, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. You know, we did look at that issue. I didn't put it on the poster, but I'd be happy to give you some more information about that later if you give me your email address. So you just want to be polite and respect that they're asking that question even if they are a jerk, and then you go on to the next person. Um, if they are behaving outwardly rude to you, and this is a conversation that needs to stop, and I'll be honest with you, I just came back from a conference where I was working at a booth, and somebody started engaging me in a conversation that was actually very offensive and borderline racist, and I had to just stop it. I had to stop the conversation. So I said, you know what? Why don't we just stop this conversation right now? They didn't take the hint, so I said it again in just that way. We need to stop this conversation right now. And then they walked away, and the, the conversation was over. But I don't want you to feel um, uh, embarrassed or ashamed. If somebody is being racist or sexist or overly offensive to you in another way, you have the right to say, you know what, we're going to stop this conversation. I, I'm not going to, you know, we, we, we're going to stop this, and we're going to, you know, I have to work, talk to some other people now. You don't have to call them a pig. You don't have to call them a name. You can just stop the conversation conversation, tell them you're doing so, and move on to the next person. Now, there's also another type of person that shows up, which is the whack jobs. These are the people who want to ask you about psychics and astrology and you know, that there are, there's another earth that's behind the sun that we just don't know about. And just be as polite to them as possibly can uh, without insulting them. They're not trying to insult you. They're just on another plane of existence. A couple of thoughts. Again, we're going to be professional. There's no small posters, only small people who do posters. But none of you are small because now you get the idea of how you can really advance your career and really advance your science by giving such an amazing poster. If we're not going to be presenting or or we're not at the poster when it's already up on the bulletin board, leave a note letting people know when you will be there. If you have to step away, leave a note and wear appropriate clothing. Don't look like you just came in from the field. Wear a nice suit if you have it. If you don't feel comfortable in a suit, wear at least a nice pair of chino pants, you know, not jeans, a nice button down shirt, a blazer if you'd like. Just look a little bit more clean and clear and cut, you know, clean cut, and like you really are thinking carefully and seriously about what you're presenting. And of course, after you present your poster at the conference, it can continue on in perpetuity until the end of time. You can post it on your LinkedIn profile. You can make note of it on your CV and on your LinkedIn profile. You can offer to post it in your department, post it on your blog. You use it as a business card for, for the future, and you can make it part of your portfolio if you have a website or a blog. Like I said, you can post it there too. So with that, I want you to keep in mind that the poster opportunity, the opportunity to present a poster, provides you with so much more than just physically demonstrating or communicating your research. It gives you an opportunity to network with new people, to share your excitement for your science and engineering and math and, and technology, and to really see how you can build win-win partnerships and alliances with new populations. So really take advantage of that poster opportunity that you have. A couple of acknowledgments. I'd like to thank these people and these organizations for these great posters, uh, these great posters and these great tips uh, of, of producing posters. This talk, this post, this presentation, this webinar on posters has been recorded, so you'll be able to catch more of this later. And I just wanted at the last moment just to tell you about some really great events that are going to be happening at the AGU Fall Meeting. The Career Center is going to be alive and well. It's going to be in the main area of Moscone. You can go to this website to get more information. I'm going to send you an email with this, these links as well. But there's a number of programs for students and for job seekers at the Career Center and throughout the conference that you can take advantage of. There's the really great outstanding 
student paper awards, which provides opportunities for students to engage with scientists, discuss their work, and be provided with feedback regarding their presentation skills. And I'm going to be giving a whole bunch of talks and doing one-on-one -on -one career consultations. I'm going to be doing an open career Q&A, and I'm going to be doing a book signing for my book, Networking for Nerds, on Monday night. So I'm going to send you this information as well since you signed up for this. And if you want more data or information about it, I can get you that. But with that, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you about posters and how you can really leverage the heck out of them to really enjoy the conference, to get find new collaborators and promote the work that you've done. And I hope you found this, uh, this helpful. Again, this has been recorded. It will be available on the AGU website. And there'll be a companion article that I'll be producing about this topic that will also be produced and put on the AGU Career Center website. So you'll get some more information about that too. Um, I'm looking to see if anybody has any questions and I don't see any major questions right now. So um, somebody asked a couple of quick questions. This is a good one. Is it necessary to locate the title centered at the top of the poster? Yes, put it in the center of the poster. It's the biggest and most important thing. So put it in the center. And somebody said, is it better to use the horizontal position instead of the vertical you know this is another question that you would ask the poster coordinator for the conference is the what is the size of the of the where you will be posting the poster what's the size of the bulletin board can you do a vertical one if you want versus a horizontal I like the horizontal way better because it allows you to do that 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 um, that uh, that that the design organization that I provided for you where you have basically three to four major columns and each column reads left to right and down and then you go to the second column and it reads down and you go to the third column it reads down it's just a little bit easier to put that somebody asked where should we put the references you could put them at the end of the poster just sort of in a little text box in its own um, you could also Somebody asked, um, I've seen posters that don't include references or a bibliography. Should they absolutely be included? This is a question that you can you, you can ask to consult with your advisor or with your collaborators. You don't necessarily have to include the, the bibliography, but you know, if you're specifically citing certain papers, I think that would be useful to put that on there. So if there are any other questions, and I know a number of, of them are coming in right now, I'm going to be answering them. Keep bringing them, keep sending them. I'm going to answer them in the companion article that I'm going to be producing for the AGU Career Center website because we're out of time right now so unfortunately I don't have any time more to answer these questions but maybe I'll put together a poster for the next conference where I answer these questions in addition to that article but I want to thank you again so much for the opportunity to speak with you today about this topic I thank AGU and the AGU Career Center and um, you'll be hearing from me via email I hope you'll join me on LinkedIn I hope you'll work with me on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, join me on Facebook, and email me for a free resume template. And I look forward to working with you, and I know you're just going to kick butt the next time you have a poster. And when I see you at the fall meeting, I'm going to look for your fabulously designed and executed poster, because I know it's going to be great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, evening, or midnight, wherever you are. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and this concludes our webinar today. Thank you.